Aloha. I am your host, Winston Welch, and I am delighted that you are joining us today for this Out and About Show special edition where we're, every other week we explore a variety of topics, organizations, and events with the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization. Joining me today in the studio, I am honored to have Leilani Maxera, Overdose Prevention Manager with the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, whose motto is reducing harm, promoting health, creating wellness, and fighting stigma in Hawaii and the Pacific. Welcome to the show today, and thanks again for being my guest. Thanks so much for having me today. So this is a very uh, great time. You guys have been on the show before. You do wonderful work. Uh, how long have you been with, with HHHRC? Oh, personally, I've worked with the organization for about four and a half years. Okay, so you, you, you were there before it merged with the two? Yes, so we, we did merge about, um, it's been a little over a year. Uh, previously, we were two separate organizations. Uh, Life Foundation, which was uh, known as the AIDS Service Organization for Oahu, the main one, and then the Chow Project, Community Health Outreach Work to Prevent HIV AIDS, and we were mostly known for being the syringe exchange for the state. For the, for the whole state. So yes. your services are not just on Oahu, they are statewide? Our syringe exchange services and our overdose prevention program are statewide. Um, our, a lot of our other services are only on Oahu. So we do HIV testing, hep C testing. We have a smoking cessation program. We have HIV case management. We have a transgender services program. We have a lot going on. We have almost 60 employees. Uh, but the majority of our services are just Oahu-based. Our syringe exchange and overdose prevention, we have staff on Oahu, Kauai, Maui, and Big Island. Oh, okay. So you're basically statewide except for Molokai and Lanai. And we can, and we can work with them if need. Okay. And so you are the, uh, the manager of overdose prevention. Mm -hmm. what, does, what does that entail? What is that? So uh, the syringe exchange program started first, and our overdose prevention program was born out of that. Um, the syringe exchange program, um, we're actually celebrating 30 years of syringe exchange in Hawaii this week. And our overdose prevention program, though the whole time we've been doing syringe exchange and education around drug use with um, our participants, we talked about overdose prevention. Uh, it was only in the last two and a half years that the, um, almost three years now, the drug naloxone has been legal to carry for lay people in the state and that we've been able to distribute it. And what naloxone is, is an overdose reversal drug for people who overdose on an opiate. So that's very much expanded our overdose prevention program and allowed us to do trainings and give that out for free to people. Now, so does Hawaii have a really big drug problem? Is it, how is it compared to the rest of the nation? And so in terms of, and you've probably seen this if you pay close attention to the news, uh, a lot of news about opiates in the past several years, uh, in terms of Hawaii, actually opiates are not the, the main drug of choice here. So when you look at opiate overdose, we actually uh, have, are quite low in terms of uh, the numbers per capita. A few years ago, before our naloxone program started, we were at 43 out of um, the state's uh, overdose numbers from opiates. We were at 43rd in the country. Now we're at 50. Uh, it's out of 51 because it includes Washington, D.C. Okay. So our rates of opiate overdose um, deaths are actually quite low compared to many other states. Uh, we do have opiates here, um, but ICE, or otherwise known to many people, methamphetamine, um, is our you know, main drug of choice here in Hawaii comparatively. So we, um, but we are seeing issues with opiate overdose that is accidental also for people who think they're only taking ICE because we do have an issue with fentanyl being found in all drugs, um, no matter what they are. Um, so people may accidentally take an opiate when they did not necessarily mean to. And that's an issue we're seeing countrywide is fentanyl contamination in the drug supply. Oh, boy. It's, uh, I, you know, I, I, this, it, it's interesting because this week you said we're celebrating uh, International Overdose uh, Awareness Day. Yes, we are. And internationally, it's celebrated on the 31st, which mm -hmm. is Saturday. But mm -hmm. this, uh, in Hawaii, we're going to do a different day. Yeah, so we're celebrating on the on Thursday, uh, the which is the 29th, instead of the International Day of the 31st, because it falls on a weekday. 
and it was easier for us to get a venue and to get people to be able to work for us at the event, et cetera. So we're celebrating a little early, um, and it's also because we decided to do the event in conjunction with our 30-year celebration of syringe exchange. So we'll be celebrating both in one day. So, so I suppose celebrating that we've had uh, th this program there mm -hmm. that have saved so many lives and, and helped so many people in its harm reduction approach, and maybe recognizing and being aware of the, the, the International Overdose uh, Awareness Day. It's, it's, it's both of these. Where is this going to take place? So the event is going to be at Harris United Methodist Church. It's on New Wanu and the uh, cross street uh, close by his vineyard. And so it's going to be 1130 to 2. And so what we're going to be doing for the event is we're going to um, have lunch served. For, it's events completely free and no need RSVP. Uh, we're going to have lunch served, and then we're going to have opening remarks from the Department of Health and our executive director. We're going to be debuting a, actually a short documentary that's being made about the history of syringe exchange in our islands. Um, and then we're going to have a panel with people who were there from at the beginning who helped to get the syringe exchange started here, and then people who do uh, currently also work in syringe exchange to talk about how it's changed. We are also going to do naloxone trainings for people. Um, if, if someone does not have a naloxone kit, they can come that day, get trained individually by one of our staff, and take home an overdose prevention kit with them. Um, we're also going to have a memorial set up um, to honor the lives of people we've lost to overdose. We do this every year, and you can come and add a name if you would like to the memorial as well. And uh, for someone that's, that would be coming to get a naloxone kit, mm -hmm. are these, would these be family members of a, of a user, or yes. are, is so, it mostly for law enforcement? Or, so uh, we, we uh, recommend that anybody who has any sort of, uh, every community member, actually, we really recommend people get a naloxone kit. We really focus on getting the kits out to the drug-using community, so our participants of the syringe exchange and their loved ones because who's more likely to be present when somebody overdoses? It's going to be other people who use drugs and their loved ones, family members, people they live with. Uh, we also um, focus on training service providers um, in social services, so people at treatment centers, people at the houseless shelters, um, and other nonprofits that work with the community we serve. We also have trained some of the police departments, uh, and they carry naloxone. Maui Police Department actually has had several overdose reversals with naloxone that we've given them, mm -hmm. that they have actually come across people who've overdosed. But really, anybody who may come in contact with someone who's overdosed, even if you just live in Chinatown mm -hmm. and you're walking down the street, uh, we have had one individual who's reversed two overdoses on wow. separate occasions, wow. just walking down the street and coming across someone who's overdosed. Wow, that's it's really powerful, and I think, it's important to remember that this is, this is, these are diseases. These affect the mind and the body in ways that are very complex. And well, many, there's, we'll get into the pros and cons of that later, but can you tell us how does, how, how do the, and, and one of your things is fighting the stigma in Hawaii mm -hmm. and the Pacific so that people can, can have access to resources mm -hmm. and harm reduction. Can you tell us what is harm reduction? Well, harm reduction is something that we all use in our everyday lives, and it's, it's just what it sounds like, reducing the harm of things that hurt us. So every day we each do something that we know is bad for us, and we do it anyway. If you drove here today, you put your seatbelt on. If you rode a bike, you put a helmet on. Mm -hmm. So harm reduction is really what we use every day in our lives. We, do, we all do things we know have negative consequences. Uh, the difference with harm reduction in the work that we, we do is that you know, people oftentimes see drug use as a moral issue. So it's hard for them to discern the differences when in reality we're trying to do the same thing, is reduce the harm of activities that hurt us. And what would, the, what would some of those tangible results be from this program? So the most basic definition of harm reduction is any positive change. So if we're working with folks to create any positive change in their lives, um, that's much better road to go down than abstinence-only education. Because when you use abstinence-only education, you're telling people, stop. What you're doing is bad. You're a bad person. Um, you know, you're not giving them the tools they actually need to make change in their lives. And so you know, if I'm counseling somebody and we're talking about their use, and they, um, you know, we call ready for change. Because someone's not ready for change, nothing's going to stick. Like if I decide I want to make any sort of change, I want to start going to the gym every day, yeah. starting tomorrow, right? And I'm not really ready for change, it's, it's not, not going to happen, happen, right? Yeah. 
So what we do is we, you know, we use motivational interviewing and other techniques when we work with folks to, um, you know, elicit where they're at. We have to meet them where they're at, not yes. where we're at, yep. not what we think is best for them. Um, what's what they're, you know, what they think is best is usually where we're going to start because they know best what's best for them. And so sometimes that might look like, oh, so you know, you're looking to make a change and and use less. So if you shot up. 10 times yesterday, let's try what would it look like for seven tomorrow and make small incremental changes with folks. And then sometimes they're, they're very much ready for change and they want to quit that day and that's fantastic too. But we meet people where they're at so that we can match how um, our interventions and our referrals with what they need at the time. So you have case managers, if people come in and they, whatever their, their health or housing or um mental condition is you have uh, or physical health you have case yeah. managers where you can connect them with appropriate yeah. services well I'd love it if we had uh, funding to have more case managers we mostly have outreach workers okay. and so what the folks we work with they come to us they come to the syringe exchange and talk to our syringe exchange outreach workers and we build rapport with people so there can be times where actually we have folks we serve for years who we never know their real name we're an anonymous service and we're anonymous so that people can feel comfortable trusting us and coming to us. And when, and sometimes people right away tell us their story, tell us their name, we build a rapport quickly, and when they're ready for referral, we'll make that. Um, but sometimes it takes much longer, you know, a few years they'll come, they'll, you know, start talking story with our folks, finally tell us what they need. And so they work with my outreach workers quite a bit. We can do referrals to other services um, outside of the agency. And now that we've merged, one great thing about our organization now is that we have tons of services within one agency to refer to. And we do have a certified substance abuse counselor who we can refer folks to who are ready to go into treatment. And so tell us about the mechanics of this. Do they come down to your headquarters or do they meet a van or how, how, how can they find out information about a syringe exchange? So um, on island, on Oahu, we actually have two outreach vans. One parks in Chinatown Monday through Friday during the day. And where is and that? And that's uh, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. downtown. Um, and then we have another van that each day of the week, it goes to a different part of the island. Mm -hmm. And that's really to reach the folks that are the most vulnerable who can't make it in to see us. So if somebody's North Shore living under a bridge, we're going to go to them. And so we go Waikiki in town, uh, West Side, North Shore, and then Windward, different days of the week. It looks a little bit different on the neighbor islands because we actually have much less people that use our services on the neighbor islands. So we only have one outreach worker on Kauai and one on Maui, and they're appointment-based. So they don't have a set place they go. They get calls and people come meet them. And then on Big Island, Hilo side, we have a outreach worker that does park several different places. We have our schedule published on our website. And then also um, you can call. They have a voicemail that changes every day where they're at. And what is your website? It's hhhrc.org. HHHRC.org, yeah. so triple HRC.org. Yeah. And then quickly in Kona, um, we actually w uh, work with Hi Half, which is Hawaii Island HIV AIDS Foundation, and people can go to their office to exchange. Sorry, I just wanted to get that uh, in. No, thank you. And, and I suppose that information is also posted on your site as well. Yes, we have, and we have the phone numbers for each island you can call for services. Well, uh, when we get back, I suppose we're, we're, we'll take a look at some of the, the photos that we have about the actual, actual mechanics of the exchange and then some other things that bring us into awareness about this issue that's, that's um, I think, the most shocking thing I, I read what, earlier this year was that for Americans under 55, it is, overdose is the leading cause of death. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is. I think it is. Yes. Which is, I, I, it was in Time or Newsweek, so we're going to go with that. That's not fake news, and mm -hmm. and th so this is enormously high uh, accidental death. I, I suppose mm -hmm. would be a better way to say yes. that. But that these are part of the diseases of despair, and mm -hmm. that these are affecting all mm -hmm. races, mm -hmm. all ages, all ethnic groups, all yeah. socioeconomic levels. Yes. And I'm actually glad you brought up that term. It's not a widely used term, diseases of despair, deaths of despair. Um, it's, it's absolutely true. And in Hawaii, um, one of the um, overdose deaths are 
one of the uh, main causes of accidental death in our state. And then um, one of, and they're also one of the top in causes of uh, injury-related deaths in the state, but also it's suicide. And those are both considered um, deaths of despair, which we really need to look at as a society why these rates, um, and suicide rates have skyrocketed. Yes. Um, not just in Hawaii, but all over the country. And we really need to look at why um, people are turning to drugs more often. Why are people thinking um, there's, you know, having such hopelessness as well? I, it's, a, it's a really important topic. I'm so thrilled that you're here today to share with us and the very important work that you do. Um, I, I, we've got to take a short break. I'm Winston Welch. I'm a host of Out and About on this Think Tech live streaming network series where you will always find the most interesting uh, guest and host and, and topics that are really relevant and salient to our lives here. Today we are especially pleased to have Leilani Maxera, who is the Overdose Prevention Manager from Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. We'll be back in a minute, so stay tuned. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Aloha, we are back and we're live. I'm Winston Welch, and this is Out and About on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series, talking with Leilani Maxera, the Overdose Prevention Manager from the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. And this week we are uh, uh, honoring those who uh, uh, are on this path and who are working, we're, we're, we're celebrating 30 years of syringe exchange here in Hawaii and also uh, seeing that this is uh, international overdose prevention, uh, I'm sorry, international it's overdose okay. awareness, awareness day. day. Yes. And today, and this normally internationally we celebrate on the 31st, here we're gonna do it on the the 29th. We're 29th. celebrating on Thursday the 29th. Thursday the 29th yes. at Harris Methodist Church mm -hmm. from 1130 till 2. Yes. So if you're just, maybe you've got a loved one who is using mm -hmm. or you're using or or, or, what, or you're just curious yes. member we of the would, community. We would love it for, uh, for folks to come. You don't have to RSVP. Uh, but yes, if people are worried about themselves or a loved one, and they'd like to come get an uh, overdose prevention kit, for um, which is naloxin that can reverse an opiate overdose, we will have them for free. Um, or just anyone in the community who wants to talk about these issues. Many people have lost loved ones to overdose, and yeah. we invite everyone to come and learn more about our services, um, celebrate 30 years of syringe exchange in our islands, and also be there to um, you know, pay tribute and give love to the folks we've lost from overdose. Yes, and that's a part of it is that because this is every age group, it's every race, it's every ethnicity, it's, it's all socioeconomic mm -hmm. levels hitting some folks harder than others yes, that you would uh, typically might expect. But I think, you know, it's, if, since it is the leading cause of accidental death in the nation, obviously it's going to be affecting us. And mm -hmm. you, you, you hear about it, but it's, it's, um, it's something that, that your organization is right on the front lines mm -hmm. helping. So how does this work? I let's say I'm a I'm a, a user and I've got yeah. this needle and I don't want to share it with somebody else mm -hmm. because I don't want to uh, get or transmit HIV or Hep C mm -hmm. uh, or an, or any, anything else and I just want a clean needle. How does this work? So we are a one for one syringe exchange. It's actually written into the statute um, that we, in order to get a clean syringe, you must give us your dirty one first. Okay. And so if people want to come to see us, it's an anonymous exchange. And we do ask some, you know, uh, questions of like ethnicity, age, et cetera, for our own data Statistics, purposes. Yeah. 
and uh, we give people a card that they use that is also anonymous, but it has a number, so we can kind of keep track of how many times people come. Mm -hmm. um, we do a yearly evaluation. Uh, the newest one, which is available on our website, is from 2017. The 2018 one is coming out soon. And so we do try to get some data from our folks, but it is anonymous. And so people come to us, and you can refuse as well. If you really, really don't even want a number, that's okay. Yeah. We'll serve anyone who wants to exchange. And so when someone comes to us, um, you know, we count how many syringes they have, ask which ones they want, um, exchange the dirty syringes for clean ones, and then also other things they may need. So we have other harm reduction tools. Uh, we have condoms, lube. We also give out um, things like pipe covers. A lot of folks actually smoke um, out of glass pipes, and it's a hepatitis C risk. Mm. Uh, if you have an open sore and blood on your lips and you share with somebody else, um, things and it, other things that go along with um, injection drug use that could get blood on them. Um, we also give out snacks when we have water, but also referrals to other services. So if someone comes to the van and they want housing um, or you know mental health services, if they want to know where to go to get their IDs, we talk story with folks and give them referrals to and the other I think we have a picture need. of the van uh, here that you, that goes out, and it's in Chinatown mm -hmm. every day. You say, oh, in fact, Monday through Friday. Monday yeah. through Friday, and this is a picture of the Surgeon General Jerome Adams, I yes. believe, Dr. right? Dr. Adams, yes. And what's he doing here? Just seeing so, how it works. Th so this was amazing. We actually were so blessed to have him come visit us a couple weeks ago. So he was coming to the islands to do several visits. He went to the medical school to give a talk. He visited other services on the island, but he is very supportive of syringe exchange. He was um, the state, uh, oversaw the state uh, Department of Public Health um, under Pence when they had that HIV and hepatitis C outbreak uh, several years ago. And where, what happened there is we saw what, what really what happens when a state hasn't legalized syringe mm -hmm. exchange and people are sharing syringes. So we had um, whole communities that, uh, that were drug using that ended up HIV and hep C positive because yeah. they didn't have access to sterile syringes. Well, I, I think one of that here, if uh, so I just Googled, uh, when our current vice president was governor of Indiana, mm -hmm. we had a mass outbreak. Yes. And this is an interesting one because they went back and they, they did a statistical mathematical modeling of oh. how many cases would have been prevented. avoided, prevented. Yeah. And they said it, should, it would have been 10 cases or fewer if uh, they had, had a syringe yes. exchange program based on all the data that they could crunch yes. and, and compare to this. Instead, 215 people became HIV infected and probably yes. a lot more with hep C because it's a yes. lot more infectious disease. Yeah, from we, what I there, we saw a lot of co-infections there with hep C and HIV. And for us, because the people that came together and, and saw it was the governor's task force, task force on AIDS, um, they came together, um, members of that, they really you know, heard about syringe exchange happening other places. And they really very quickly jumped on the bandwagon for that. Um, and we're so lucky that they had the foresight to know that this would be a good prevention tool here in Hawaii, because we actually have half the prevalence rates of HIV in our drug using community than there is nationally. And so, and, and you can attribute that probably almost directly to, uh, to needle exchange. Yes, yes. And how many states do have needle exchanges? Um, I think right now it's, it's legal in I'm, I'm sorry if I'm wrong on this, uh, 43 states. There's still some states that are it's just becoming legal. Okay. Um, there's places like Indiana where when they had the outbreak, um, it wasn't legal. And then they, they legalized syringe exchange and some counties brought it in, but and it's still so not did. fully legal. And a lot of states also, um, like they had issues in Indiana, aren't following best practices right. either. And so that's really important um, in terms of uh, meeting people where they're at, having it, uh, run in a way that's uh, fr user friendly so that folks actually will come for the services, which includes things like they were doing when they first brought syringe exchange to Indiana. There were places where the police were present during right. syringe exchange. Which doesn't which, make you want to. Which made people afraid to come. And even with us, um, one thing that Dr. Adams was, I mean, he, it was an amazing visit because he asked us so many questions. I mean, he just, you saw from that picture, he yeah. just jumped right in the syringe exchange van and, start, and went through our things. Um, you know, he asked us a lot of questions about our syringe exchange, and one thing is we are a one-for-one one exchange. 
um, you know, we have to get to give, give one back to give one out. Yeah. yeah. And in many states, that's not the case. They give people what they need and ask for. So that's something we discussed with him. It, that's considered a best practice. Uh, because a lot of things happen with our folks. They do, um, you know, their bags get stolen, you know, they're homeless, their stuff gets stolen, or maybe they got caught up in a sweep in a park yeah. and their things got taken. And so, so a lot of times they don't have one to exchange. One thing we're lucky for is that we do have a law here that you can purchase syringes at a pharmacy without a prescription. Mm -hmm. But the only problem with that is it's not called this, but it's essentially a morality clause where the individual pharmacist working at the time can refuse to serve you. And so unfortunately, um, that's something we need to look at changing for sure in the okay. future, but it also means that we don't have true full access for folks who need a syringe. Hopefully you're getting a, a yeah. pharmacist who is actually moral and realizes yeah. it's he's or she is doing the best thing for the, yeah. the patient. Now I saw that like when you were saying the needle exchanges here, there's a a 2012 study published in the journal Drug and Alcohol Dependence comparing San Francisco, a city with needle exchange, to Miami, a city without needle exchanges, mm -hmm. and more than eight times as many syringes were found on the streets of Miami mm -hmm. because, and drug users were just throwing yeah. the needles everywhere compared to San Francisco. Yeah. We got a couple more slides I did want to cover just, mm -hmm. to, just to touch on these because uh, this is the naloxone kit that yes. you will have available yes. on Thursday. So that is what we give to folks for free. Uh, we just train you how to use it. To prevent an overdose. To prevent op it or to it help only works prevent for opiate overdose. Opiate it's an opiate overdose reversal drug. Okay, and we've got another couple slides here, which is the pros of needle exchange. We'll just quickly read on, on these. There's lower numbers of contaminated needles in the community, reduced drug-related behavior, reduced sexual risk behavior, increased access to drug treatment referral services, increased access to uh, testing and diagnostic services, increase access to education, substance abuse, and increased communication with hard to reach population, and reducing the prevalence of new infections. A lot of people will say, mm -hmm. uh, this is immoral to do this. Mm -hmm. We're not going to give them the, the time of air today. They can Google that yeah. and decide yeah. uh, that this doesn't, uh, okay. But uh, okay. we've got a couple more slides yeah. on here to, because this is International Overdose Awareness Week, let's call it week. But mm -hmm. you can see the number, the number of deaths per 100,000 went from three in this nation to about 14 per 100,000 mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. in the span of 20 years, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, that's opioid deaths alone. This mm -hmm. is not the other uh, uh, yeah. overdoses, but we've got another yes. slide that does talk to us about the other overdoses. We have alcohol overdose, mm -hmm. which is a major, um, probably the major drug in our society that yes, happens. For sure. Alcohol is the drug of choice here. Much more people are drinking alcohol than using opioids. And, and in the toxic levels. Mm -hmm. Depressant overdoses, you mentioned, were things like uh, 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 benzodiazepines, benzos, other types Valium, of um, sleeping pills that aren't opiates. Sleeping yes. pills. Okay, and opioids are uh, heroin, Oxycontin, Oxycontin. Um, basic uh, methadone, anything that's uh, opiate derived from the opiate -derived. poppy plant. And psychoactive, we won't get into too much in that. And stimulant overdose is uh, the methamphetamine, crystal meth, ice. Yeah. But uh, And you said also earlier when we were talking the alcohol and the depressants, so people taking alcohol and then maybe shooting yes. up or people so that are mixing alcohol or um, other depressants with an opiate is one of the main ways people can overdose. Um, heroin and other opiates are already depressants. And so if you just, if you add more depressants into the mix in your body, uh, your heart rate, your breathing goes down. So it's, a, okay. you know, we really recommend to folks not to mix those things if, if possible. Don't mix it. And, and we've got one final slide if we can come up mm -hmm. with there is that here it is. Time to remember, time to act. And I like this slide because it shows, you know, a man and his kid probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this is, it shows that this is affecting all members of our community. We, we, have, we have a lot of work to do here, but it sounds like Hawaii has a model program and uh, with wonderful people like you yeah. that, are, that are in charge of this thing and, you're, and all of the wonderful coworkers that you have who are right on the front lines of our society. I thank you personally for for the work that you do, it's so important, Thank so you. critical. Thank you. Uh, and I really just respect your um, your career choice and the, the choice of, of the great people that you work with at the Hawaii Health 
and Harm Reduction Center. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Okay. Will you come back again and maybe we can talk some more on this? I would love to. Okay, that would be my great pleasure because you are inspiring to me and a lot of people that are thank out there you. today. Thank so they can so go much. to hhhrc.org for more information. Yes, and we'd love it if they came to our event on Thursday. August 29th, 11.30 to 2 p.m. at Harris United Methodist Church. Okay, and that's on New Uanu and Vineyard. Around roughly. Vineyard, yeah. Well, sadly, this is another windup of Out and About. We have been talking with Leilani Maxera, the Overdose Prevention Manager from Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, and the very great work that they do for our community. Thank you again, Leilani. I look forward to you coming back. We thank you, our guest, for tuning in every week, and we welcome your feedback. Thanks to our broadcast engineer who wore many hats today, Mr. Robert McLean, and uh, our executive producer, Jay Fidel, who puts it all together. I'll see you every other Monday here on Out and About. Be well, be happy, get involved with your community, and aloha.